end of the spectrum. And we're going to focus on prophecy concerning one man and see what the scriptures have to say about this man, Abraham. In Abraham, we're talking about a man who comes on the scene fairly early in human history. And yet, we see various elements of his life and his interaction with God playing out over centuries and centuries, even millennia of time to come, resulting in the entrance of our Savior into the world, Jesus Christ, through Abraham's descendants. And we're going to flesh that out tonight. But even to our day today, Abraham should be an important figure to us based on the connection that we have with him as people of faith, as is pointed out in the New Testament. So we did the, we did the macro last night. We're going to do a little micro tonight. So in, in the book of Genesis, we're going to, in the first part of the, uh, the lesson tonight, Let me, let me get ourselves on here. There we go. All right. We're going to be talking uh, about an, an overview of Abraham's life and the beginning of his relationship with God, which is going to take us to Genesis chapter 11. And toward the end of that chapter uh, and then through Genesis 25 and verse 10, that's the block of Scripture in Genesis that basically outlines the life of Abraham. And in Genesis 11, toward the end of that chapter, we first meet, as he is known then, as Abram. We meet him in the listing of Shem's descendants, one of the sons of Noah. According to the uh, genealogies as listed, understanding that sometimes biblical genealogies uh, skip generations, but as listed in the book of Genesis, uh, Abraham at 75 years of age, which is when he travels down into Canaan, would have been 367 years since the flood, 267 since the dispersion of Babel. So if those genealogies have not skipped generations, we're talking about a fairly short period of time since the flood that we are introduced to Abraham. And the reason I think that is important, even though we're talking several hundred years, the divine record, again, so far as we have it listed, shows no specific interaction with God and men since the Tower of Babel and the scattering of men. But now, after this 300-and-something year period, God is ready to implement in a more specific way, the redemptive scheme that he had in his mind before the foundation of the world, which we mentioned some last night. What that is going to entail is the selection of a man, Abraham, through whom God will bring an entirely new nation into existence, from whom eventually the Savior will come. And we're going to again, build out on that story in the lesson tonight. Let's see if I have... There we go. In Genesis chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, the record says, this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldees. And so, ultimately, Abraham comes from Ur. And under God's direction and God selecting Abraham specifically for this particular purpose, he calls Abraham out of that native land, Ur, and directs him into Genesis chapter 12, into the land that God is going to promise to him and his descendants. When we are introduced to this city, Ur of the Chaldees. This was already in this day an, an ancient and well-developed city. It's where the Tigris and Euphrates River uh, flowed together into the Persian Gulf. And so when God, as known today, when God called Abraham to leave his home, this was an incredible command that was given to him that we probably don't appreciate very much today. 
but to leave all things familiar to him, even though his family went with him, uh, to travel under very difficult, arduous, dangerous conditions and go 600 miles to the northwest following the route of the Tigris and Euphrates, otherwise known as the Fertile Crescent. Abraham obeys God and goes with his father and two of his brothers and they travel uh, northwest and settle in an area known as Haran. Now here's what I think is interesting at this part of the story. Keep a finger in Genesis. We'll be back there in a minute. But turn over to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24. This is at the end of the book of Joshua and the end of Joshua's life. And now the descendants, jumping ahead in the story a little bit, the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, have come into the land of Canaan. But notice what is said here looking backwards. Joshua 24 and verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Drop down to verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord. This is Joshua imploring the Israelites who are under the law of Moses. Fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river, and in Egypt serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's obviously the most well-known passage probably in the book of Joshua. But that's not the focus. Here is Abraham's father and family were idolaters. And God is calling them out of idolatry to recognize him as the true and living God, and to establish a special relationship with Abraham for reasons that we will discuss tonight. Isn't it interesting to learn that the Israelites never completely let go of the idols of their ancestors? 500 years later, 500 years later, after we're introduced to Abraham, they still carried with him. Joshua said, the idols of their fathers that were from the other side of the river, as well as the idols from Egypt. What is God doing in calling Abraham? God is deliberately isolating Abraham from all things familiar to him, from his family, as he will leave the family behind in Haran and travel south into the land that God is promising him. What's he doing? God is making it obvious that what is going to transpire in the life of Abraham is going to be his doing. And I hope to show you how incredible this whole story is in the rest of the lesson tonight. So Abraham does leave his father, and he, actually Tira passes away, but he leaves and goes, leaves the rest of his family, goes down uh, into Canaan, and this is where his relationship with God is going to grow and develop. So let's take a look at Genesis chapter 12 and consider what is the basis of this relationship with God and Abraham and the purpose of his calling Abraham. So let's begin reading in verse 1 of Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go into the land of Canaan, so they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land 
to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. This is the beginning of what I referred to last night, if you were here last night, of God taking the long route in providing salvation for men. What I meant by that is, when men sinned originally in the garden, Adam and Eve, why didn't God send a Savior then? Well, in short, I observed last night, I hope correctly, that mankind as a whole wasn't ready for that yet. God had to work with man and help him grow up and mature in spiritual things so that when the Savior came, men would appreciate that. So God took the long route or the long view in all of this, and he decided he was going to create a whole special nation through whom the Savior would come into the world. And the genesis of that in Genesis is the selection and isolation of Abraham. And here, the promises that God is making uh, with Abraham. And so what we're beginning to see is this very beginning process of God setting aside, creating and setting aside a special people in relationship with him that in spite of their flaws, in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of their idolatry, which only got worse over the course of time, God would be able all the more clearly to demonstrate that it was he who was behind what was going on with the Israelites and what would come from them. And so Abraham enters the land of Canaan at 75 years of age, and he has no children. That is significant because of one of the promises God is making to Abraham. You're going to be the father of a whole nation. Your descendants will be like the sand of the seashore and like the sand of the heavens. And so what God is doing is pushing the limits as far as they can be pushed, both in Abraham's personal life and even relative to pure biology. God is going to push the issue here so that it will be all the more apparent that things did not develop out of natural progression and time, but in fact it was the ingenuity, the power, and even the providence of God at work in Abraham. So... You have studied, again, the Old Testament, as I understand, in recent times. So this, a lot of this is review to you. But there's a threefold promise made between God and Abraham here. One would involve this land that is being promised to him. And so we've just read about God promising that land to Abraham, but it's repeated several times. Let's read a couple of these passages because they're going to come into play a little bit later. Genesis 13, beginning in verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. And uh, for all the land which you see, I give, you, uh, give to you and your descendants forever. Chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt, to the great river, the, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, the Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. What's the point in listing all of those people? This is an occupied land. It belongs to somebody else. And yet God is saying to Abraham, I'm going to give you and your descendants this land. This, again, is going to take about 500 years to be fulfilled, as we read from the book of Joshua. So God is promising them a, a piece of property, or Abraham at this point, but his descendants will inherit this land, a land that Abraham never knew specifically as his own. The book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11 about Abraham living uh, as, as a sojourner in this land, occupied by others. He's the rightful heir and possessor of the land as a promise from God, but he never enjoys that land. He never takes title deed to the land during his lifetime. But it gets more interesting than that. The second part of the promise is that a new nation would spring from Abraham's currently non-existent descendants. 
Abraham is being guaranteed in that promise a blessing, protection, which makes it all the more interesting that Abraham twice ends up lying about the relationship that he has with his wife Sarah out of his fear. When he did that, he had no children. But God has promised him that you're going to have children and they're going to become a great nation. Abraham was a man of faith, yes. He was not a perfect man. No human beings outside the Lord are perfect human beings. But Abraham is held up to us as a man of great faith, a faith that we ourselves should emulate. God then elaborates on this promise of a nation coming from Abraham's descendants. In Genesis 15, begin reading with me in verse 2. This is where Abraham is not sure how all of this is going to work out, and he's beginning to question God at various times along the way. And God is having to reassure Abraham, even though he's you know, 75 plus at this time, things aren't developing like perhaps he thought they might. And he's getting older, he's reaching that outer limit of being able to bear children. So Abram says in chapter 15 and verse 2, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And if you're a New Testament student, the next verse has great significance. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Abraham's a little bit shaky here. I don't know how all this is going to work out, Lord. You keep telling me I'm going to have children. They're going to become this great nation. And my wife and I are barren. And we're getting older every day. And so God reiterates, as he did the land promise, he reiterates the nation promise. Go to chapter 17. Begin reading with me in verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, God is saying to Abraham here. And you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Remember... Those two passages we just read, they'll come up a little bit later. God also reiterates this to Abraham in Genesis 22, 16, and 17 after he raised the knife to kill the only son that he finally had with Sarah at the command of God. Again, I'll mention that a little bit later. So what do we have in regard to these promises of God? We have a promise of a land that will eventually belong to his descendants, a promise that not only a nation, but nations would come from Abraham, but only one of those nations would be a covenant people. That would be the people of the son of promise who we know to be Isaac. Now think about the third... This, this, this story keeps getting better. Think about the third part of the promise that God is making to Abraham. He says of Abraham that his descendants and one that would come from his descendants would be a blessing to all nations. This was back in chapter 12 and verse 3, the third part of that promise, I will bless those who bless you, I'll curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the part of the promises that is a little more obscure than the others, and it's the one that will take the longest to develop. This part of the promise is also repeated in Genesis. Go to Genesis 18 and verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? This is in regard to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah coming up. Since Abraham shall surely become a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Chapter 22 and verse 18. I just mentioned this a moment ago regarding the sacrifice of Isaac. Genesis 22, but now I'm going to, let's read verses 16 through 18 here. 
By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. That is, he in intention had sacrificed Isaac, not in fact. And have not withheld your son, your only son. In blessing, I'll bless you. In multiplying, I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Okay, I've said all of that to say this. Is this not the most preposterous thing that could have ever been said to a human being? Think about it. Who in the world can select any one human being and say, from your descendants, there's going to be an entire separate nation to arise on the face of the earth? Why is that preposterous? Because anything can stop that kind of a promise from coming to fulfillment. War, famine, disease, only daughters being born, dispersion, childlessness, rebellion, you name it. There's any number of things that could interfere and intervene in a promise like this to wipe out an entire family. Genocide. These things happen in this world. And it makes it all the more incredible that God is saying, I'm going to fulfill this over the long haul. What's he saying? God is essentially saying, I'm putting my honor and my power and my foreknowledge on the line. God has to keep this promise or he isn't God. He isn't omniscient. He isn't omnipotent. Once God commits himself to something like what he's saying to Abraham. We're now going to have an acid test as to whether these are the words of men or they're the words of a divine being who has all control over all things. But that's not the best part. Have you ever thought about this? You know, there are people that are born into this world and they do some incredible act of service or they accomplish something great, and through them, they are a blessing to people who follow them. Men can have great influence for good and accomplish great things to benefit future generations. You know what God is saying to Abraham? When I bring your descendant into the world, which we know to be about 2,000 years later in Jesus Christ, He'll bless all nations that live before him. How is that possible? You ever heard of somebody being born into the world and an accomplishment that they've achieved blessed people that are already dead? How can you make that kind of a promise? How are people already dead blessed? That's what God is saying to Abraham. Now, again, if you're a New Testament student, you know how that's going to be fulfilled because when the blood of Jesus Christ is shed on the cross, that blood is the actual payment for sin for all mankind, those that live before him and those that will ever live after. Is that not an incredible thing for God to be saying to this man at the dawn of human history, essentially? Wow. Yeah, wow. Wow. Folks, if this doesn't wow you, you can't be wowed. <laughs> How does a man bless previous generations? Only God can make this kind of a statement. And it's this third part of the promise that New Testament inspired men, apostles and prophets, deal with and, and appeal to back to the life of Abraham. So let's develop that a little bit. Turn to the book of Galatians. Chapter 3. I said, not only do we read about Abraham in the Old Testament, but New Testament writers place him in an incredibly central and very important position in regard to our faith and in regard to what was developing in the first century through Christ 
and then through the apostles and the work that they're doing and the work of the Holy Spirit. All of this is tying all the way back to Genesis 11, 12, 13, 15, 17, where God had originally made and reiterated those promises to Abraham. So let's, we're going to look at two passages in the New Testament that are going to amplify this. So one is going to be Galatians chapter 3. Begin reading with me in verse 6. Sorry for breaking into the context here, but I just want to focus on some things. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him... Oh, I can't do that. That's just really murdering the context. Uh, Go back to verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness... We just read that, didn't we? Genesis 15, 6. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Sons of Abraham. Hmm. Descendants. God had a lot to say about Abraham's descendants. And when you first think about that in an Old Testament context, it's genetic descendants. That's not the meaning here. Those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, look at verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, what? In you all the nations will be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. What are we reading here? We're reading that what's happening, what's developing now, post the cross, after the cross. And Jew and Gentile both being allowed to re-enter a relationship with God that they had broken because of their sin. God is making this possible as a result going all the way back to those promises that he originally made. What is being emphasized here is not a genetic relation to Abraham. That was not, that's not to be discounted because it's the genetic relationship going all the way back to Abraham, Abraham that God promised would be intact until Abraham's descendant, the seed, which he develops further into chapter 3 here in Galatians, until that seed would come, God committed himself to retaining that genetic connection to the nation of Israel, that genetic connection down the line. They had a role to play in all of this. But that's not ultimately what God was aiming at relative to a people that would belong to him. He's not looking for genetic connections. He's looking for spiritual connections. That's why he's talking here about those that are of faith are the sons of Abraham, not the ones just genetically connected. Now, does this ring a bell to you at all? Go back to the Gospel of John, verse 8. Jesus had this very conversation with the Jewish leaders in his own day. John chapter 8, and we'll begin reading. We'll begin reading in verse 37. John chapter 8 and verse 37. This is where Jesus is having an all out debate with the Jewish rulers and listen to the basis of the debate. John 8, 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. He's speaking genetically there. I know that you're Abraham's descendants. But you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Now, notice he said in verse 37, I know you're Abraham's descendants. But now in verse 39, he says, if you were Abraham's children. One case he's speaking genetically, the other case he's speaking of faith, and he says, you lack it. You don't have Abraham's faith. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father... Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? 
because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. This is bare knuckles brawling. Jesus is telling them like it is. You have no resemblance to your father Abraham relative to faith. What did Abraham do? Left her of the Chaldees, left his family, went to a land. God didn't even tell him where he was going. Do you do that when you move? You just go someplace, you don't have any idea where you're going? Or do you go check out the schools, you go check out the property, you go check out crime rates, you go check out all kinds of things to make sure this is where I really want to move? Abraham didn't do any of that. I'll show you where you're going. Yes, Lord. Now compare that attitude with now that Abraham's seed, Christ, according to Galatians 3, now that Abraham's seed after 2,000 years of God keeping his promises against the lack of faithfulness on the part of Israel, Jesus comes into the world to save them, and what is their attitude toward him? They want to kill him, and Jesus calls them out on it and says, you are not of your father, Abraham, because of what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, those that are of faith are true descendants of Abraham. But notice this, in Genesis, uh, back in, in Galatians chapter uh, 3, Paul is quoting Genesis 15, 6, which we read earlier, where Abraham believed God, and that belief is accounted or put down to his account as righteousness. Was Abraham sinless? No. We just referred to that a moment ago. He lied and on two occasions and probably did other things as well, but they're not recorded. But Abraham had questions, and, and, and he, it, at times he transgressed the, the word of God, but he was a man of essential belief in and faith in and trust in and obedience to God. Several times we read in Genesis, he went here and made an altar to God. He went there and made an altar to God. He worshiped and served God, coming out of that idolatry that was characteristic of his family while they were still in Ur. Abraham grew in his faith just like you and I have to grow in our faith. Now, back in Galatians 3, let's drop down to uh, verse uh, 13 through 16. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham verse 14, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is uh, confirmed, no one annuls, uh, or, uh, annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed, who is Christ. I don't want to overassume, but I would, I think, on good grounds, assume everybody in this building tonight is Gentile. We don't have any genetic relation to Abraham, no genetic connection. But we can still be the children of promise, the children of Abraham, by our response to Jesus Christ. That's what God not only is looking for, that's all he ever looked for. Nobody is going to ride into heaven on anybody else's coattails. God is looking at each and every one of us and evaluating us on the basis of whether we have a faith modeled after that of Abraham. Now, I understand we live under a different covenant. We live under the covenant of Christ. Abraham was in the period of Bible history we call the, the patriarchal age. He predated even the Mosaic Covenant that God made with his descendants later on. But still, Abraham becomes a model of faith. But it's, it's more than that. It is through the genetic line coming from Abraham that the seed, Christ, has come into the world. And it is by virtue of our attachment to Christ, which God enables us Gentiles to do, though we're not in the family of Abraham genetically, he allows us to be absorbed into this universal family of faith. And all of that is traced back to Abraham. So drop down to verses 26 through 29. 
in Galatians 3, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Watch the next verse. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. What promise? That third promise that God made to Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Friends and brethren, that means today, potentially anybody who has the faith of Abraham, anybody who comes to faith in Jesus Christ, can enter into the family of God and be saved from their sins. But it also means that the blood that Jesus shed is really, in fact, what paid for the sins that were committed by those who were of faith before Jesus ever came into the world. We learn from Hebrews uh, chapter 10, the blood of bulls and goats doesn't take away sin. But God did promise those living under the Mosaic law that they would be forgiven on the offering of animal sacrifices, not because the blood of an animal paid for anything. It was promissory. It was looking into the future of what God knew he would do in Jesus Christ. That is, the true redemptive blood would be shed later. And God, by promise to the Israelites, said... When you sin, if you offer this sacrifice under these conditions and follow these rules and guidelines, I will forgive you of your sin. I think a lot of brethren misunderstand this. We read Hebrews 10 and verse 4, and we forget to read Leviticus. How many times in Leviticus does God say, if you do this, I will forgive your sin? And it, it's kind of a cognitive dissonance. We go, wait a minute, blood of bulls and goats don't take away sins, but God says, if you offer this lamb, I'll forgive you. And then so we get this idea of rolling forward, sins rolling forward. I don't believe that's a scriptural concept at all. I don't read rolling forward in the Bible, do you? What we read is God says, if you offer this sacrifice, I'll forgive it. But it's not by virtue of the blood of an animal. When a man sins against God, what good does it do to, to slaughter an animal except God said so? That's what he told the Israelites to do under the law of Moses knowing full well that he was going to eventually bring the sacrifice of all men into the world and through the death of Jesus on the cross, real, true, and actual payment for that sin would, would be made. That's how men living before Jesus were blessed. Folks, that can only happen by the declaration of God. It can only happen in a spiritual context. One other passage that I want to look at with you is in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. This chapter, Abraham is the central figure, and I don't have time to develop all the context of Romans. But in Romans chapter 4, Abraham is a central figure, and Paul is making an argument here based on Abraham and based on Abraham's faith, and part of this argument has to do with circumcision and that, that Abraham was declared to be uh, righteous in the sight of God. His faith was counted for righteousness, Genesis 15, 6, before he was circumcised. So all of that is, is essential context, but I'm, I'm not going to pursue that with you. But in Romans chapter 4, drop down to verse 13. After Paul establishes these points about Abraham and, and a relationship with God and that on the basis of faith, in Romans 4, verse 13, for the promise that he would be heir of the world, that's Abraham, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Then drop down to verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, listen, to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's Jew and Gentile. Not only those of the law, but those of the faith of Abraham, those who would not be Israelites by Jesus. As it is written in verse 17, I have made you a father of many nations. Where did we read that before? Genesis 17. 
as had been said of Abraham, I not will make you, I have made you. When that was said, Isaac wasn't born. I have made you the father of many nations. What does that mean? That means once God's will is stated, it can't be broken. I'm, it's done. I've made you the father of many nations. And Abraham, at times, wonders how all this is going to be. He still has faith in God, but he doesn't understand. Maybe Ishmael. Maybe Ishmael will be allowed to stand before you. God says, no. Ishmael didn't come from Sarah. You're going to have a son. You and Sarah are going to have a son. And it was not until, as we're going to read here in a minute, until after they had both reproductively died, as it were. Their bodies were not able to produce children naturally. This is showing that Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, is seeing in his own work the fulfillment of these promises made to Abraham 2,000 years prior. We mentioned this last night, that Paul had been blind to these truths because of his ideology, not because of his intellect. And maybe that's worth saying. So much of understanding the will of God is not really a matter of intellect. It, we, we, we have to look at things rationally and intellectually. But the reason so many people don't understand the word of God is not because of their intellect. It's because of their will, their lack of openness to what God has to say. And that was Paul when he was Saul. Paul is looking at his own life, looking at his work as an apostle, considering all these Gentile churches that he's establishing, and he's connecting all of this to the promises of Abraham. All right, let's read further. Romans 4, verses 18 through 22. Who, contrary to hope, as Abraham, in hope believed. What does that mean? Contrary to hope, that is, contrary to the natural biological processes of having children. He knew that was dead, that was gone, that's not an option. Contrary to hope, in hope, believed. What's he hoping in here? Not in genetics, not in biology, he's hoping in God. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. What are we doing in this series of lessons? We're tying together prophecies and fulfillment. In this case, prophecies from 2,000 years before and fulfillment. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So they both had passed that point of childbearing. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham was fully convinced that what God had promised he was able to perform. He didn't know how it was going to happen. How is this going to work out? Then he has Isaac and God says take him up on Mount Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. Aren't you glad you weren't Abraham? But I'm going to tell you something. You are, in a sense, because we're asked to have the same kind of faith. We're asked to have the same kind of faith. And I want to show you at the end here of chapter 4 what that means. This idea of God bringing life from the dead. Think about it. Bringing life from the dead. This is against human experience. Now, look, we all hear stories about the person that revives, you know, in the morgue and all this kind of stuff, and they're about to embalm somebody. Those are rare. When people, our experience is when people are actually dead, they stay dead. When things die, that's the meaning of the term, right? Terminated. When things die, they don't naturally just come back to life. Abraham had, Abraham had to believe that about his own body that God could take a dead body and bring life out of it and produce, in this case, Isaac. Now, verse 23 of Romans 4. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, that is, his faith was imputed to him for righteousness, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who what? Raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Folks, you and I have to believe 
the same principle. We have to believe that God, God will bring and did bring life from the dead, that Jesus died on the cross and on the third day God raised him from the dead. That is crucial. It is fundamental to our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior and as, the, as our Redeemer. How many times do the apostles in the book of Acts preach and God, you killed him and God raised him? We're asked to have that kind of faith that God demanded from Abraham. That's why we can say he's the father of the faithful or we can call him our father in the faith, though we're not Jews genetically. There are other references and allusions to these promises and the extension of the promises made to Abraham to the Gentiles. And we could keep on doing this till midnight, but I'm not going to be a Paul in that respect. I'm not going to keep you very long, much longer. We're, we're at the end here. But I do want to reiterate just a couple of things, and then we'll close. Abraham, as an early patriarch, lived a nomadic, yet wealthy. Abraham was a wealthy man, but he lived a nomadic life. He's identified, again, as the father of the faithful. Question, how is it possible that this man that lived so early in human history is the root of so many things that happen after him, even culminating in the death of Jesus Christ, who genetically came from the line of Abraham's descendants, how is it that we're here tonight talking about a man that lived so early in human history, and yet the fulfillment of these promises actually comes to pass 2,000 years later in Christ, and the effect of that is now 2,000 years later in your and my life today? Who's responsible for that? You want to tell me the Bible's a made-up story? You want to tell me that men got together in some room somewhere and colluded together and made up some story and, and then foisted this off on men and, and they've been fooling everybody for not 2,000 years since the New Testament was written, but go to the you know 2,000 years before that to the time of Abraham. The only reasonable, an the only reasonable answer to this is that God orchestrated it. Men don't do this sort of thing. Tell me another story. Tell me another example in human history where men made some statements about the future and then over 4,000 years kept that going. Tell me another one of those. Oh, you know, the Bible and the Quran, they're, they're just the same. They're religious books. Uh, no. The Bible and the Quran have nothing in common. Only God can do what we're reading about from Old Testament and even patriarchal age till now. This is shown throughout time by the prophets who spoke in the name of God, who continue to unfold chapter after chapter of Israelite history as it played out in real time. Again, I said God took the long view of this, right? God plays this out generation after generation after generation, century after century after century, millennia after millennia. God is playing this out in, in real time as those things were developing. All the while telling, as we said last night, what's going to happen next. Men can't do this. And this is just to reiterate, but I'll put it up here again. How can a man and his descendants and ultimate descendant distantly blessed generations of people who lived before. Jesus did that. The shedding of his blood forgave sins of those that... They forgave Abraham's sins, his own ancestors. Abraham being a man of faith. Animal sacrifices never could do that. It took the blood of the Son of God. Can you imagine... Let me just say this. Can you imagine the value of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross to pay for all of the sins of all mankind, not going back into the past and forgiving the sins of faithful men like Job and Noah and Abraham and others of the patriarchal age, and then those of the Mosaic age, 
But you know what? This, this world, this earth may stand another five, ten thousand 10,000 years, 100,000. I know of nothing biblically that says that can't happen. We don't know. We don't know how long the earth will stand. However long it stands, whatever accumulated sins will ever be committed in the future, the blood of Jesus Christ is valuable enough for God to forgive the sins of all men for all time. One person that died and shed their blood, that's how valuable Jesus Christ is. And that's how powerful his blood is. And then finally tonight, we'll dismiss ourselves here in just a moment. Whoops. I think I can. There we go. Our faith, our inclusion in the family of God today, as we've been reading tonight in Scripture, is traced to one man. One man. So again, last night we, we laid the broad foundation, but now, tonight, we're only focused on one individual from history who had a special relationship with God, wherein God said from that man, great spiritual things are going to happen in millennia to come, and lo and behold, they did. And again, this is a story no mere man could write. This is why we're, we're calling this series the, the Fingerprints of God. God is doing things and, and informing us and instructing us in his ways, in his power, in his mind, his intentions, his promises. God is, is telling us, I'm behind this. I'm behind scripture. These are not just the words of uninspired men, words that are made up, words from man's imagination. They declare too much. They're put to the test over and over and over again as to whether or not they have any power in, in those words, in those promises. How many times as a parent, true confession, how many times as a parent did you make a promise to your child that you didn't keep? Now, maybe it was a weakness in some regard, or maybe it was just things happen. You know, that happens with all of us. You say you intend to do something, something gets in the way, oh, I said I would do this, but, you know, this has come up, and I just can't do that. Think about God making all the promises that he made throughout all of history recorded in Scripture, and he always does it. He always carries it out. And he tells us ahead of time, as we quoted last night from the Old Testament, I'll tell you beforehand what's going to happen. Put me to the test. And so tonight we close by reflecting and asking each and every one of us to reflect on how much confidence do we have in this. This is the mind of God expressed to us in words we can understand. But they're also in words, written words. And I think in that, God is wanting us to work to understand him. He doesn't just open our heads and pour it all in. We have to work at it. And I think it's that work and that effort that's going to reveal something about us, how much interest we have in God, how much interest we have in what God has said to us. But it's also going to be the way in which we grow in that faith and in that confidence and that trust in God, just like Abraham had to grow. So tonight we're going to sing a song of encouragement, and it is encouragement. And, and hopefully dovetailing with the lesson tonight that you've been encouraged but it may be that you're encouraged spiritually by our being together tonight, by singing the songs we've sung, having the prayer we did, the song we're about to sing. It may be that you have been able to look inside yourself and realize there's something missing. Maybe I've not put all this together. Maybe I've not seen the big picture. Maybe I've not really appreciated God for all of his wonder and power and great promises. And I'm ready to do something about it. I can't say no to God anymore. And if you're having those thoughts and feelings, we encourage you not to say no to God anymore. So we're going to sing this song. If there's any way we can help you, strengthen you, encourage you, pray with you, study. There are those here ready and willing and able to help you in your relationship with God, to draw closer to him and, and to be strengthened in that faith that God wants to see in each and every one of us. If you have a spiritual need that can be met 